There are many tarnished in Elden Ring who attack you on sight. Anastasia Tarnished Eater, Okina, Bloody Finger Narius. It's not at all unheard of for Tarnished throughout the Lands Between to put their own goals before that of their mission, to become Elden Lord, but these attackers are clear in their pursuit of our Tarnished. They do not pretend to be our comrade or confidant. They have their mission, and we have ours. To manipulate and bend our quest to their own will while pretending to be a friendly face, that is the kind of underhanded tactic that will have you labeled as a true villain amongst the Tarnished. Today we are going to explore Sir Gideon Ofnir, the All-Knowing. Who is this legendary Tarnished? What is his ultimate goal? And how are we tied to his plans and schemes? If you've been enjoying our content, please consider subscribing to Square Table Gaming. We love seeing this community grow and really enjoy talking with everyone in the comments about their Elden Ring thoughts and theories. Whether you're a longtime subscriber or you've just found our content, thank you for hanging out with us. With that out of the way, let's talk about the all knowing head of the Round Table himself. The first time we see Gideon Offnir is during the opening narration to the game. We're introduced to noteworthy Tarnished, Horalu, Goldmask, Fia, Dung Eater, and finally, Gideon Offnir. The narrator says his name with a fervor save for those who are highly revered in their communities. We see Gideon in his casket, surrounded by silver ears and holding a box full of silver eyes. This is clearly before Gideon has had his grace returned to him and he's the only Tarnish we see given a place of respect in his burial. His resting place has his scepter on one side and the symbol of the eye surcoat on the other, while cobwebs built up on the corner show us that this casket was never actually closed. It seems as though Gideon was revered enough for his followers to make his eventual resurrection as easy as possible for him. Simply wake up, take weapon in hand, and get back to work unraveling the mysteries of the lands between. For Gideon, death was nothing more than a nap between study sessions. It can be assumed that Gideon wasted no time upon his awakening and made his way straight to the round table to continue his studies. His scepter of the all-knowing is described as a scepter in the form of a hand grasping a pearl. The pearl stands for the world, the heavens, and an eye, representing the many forms of knowledge, never fully attainable. Even knowing that, the all-knowing's hand grasps for it. From this we can glean the importance Gideon puts on knowledge. He believes that only by becoming all-knowing could he truly ascend to the throne of Elden Lord. What separates Gideon from other tarnished is his means of attaining his knowledge. Gideon comes across as a man who gains his understanding of the world through research, digging through ancient texts, and to some degree this is likely true. We see his library packed with old tomes, and he has many across his desk that have clearly been read. However, books and scrolls are not his only means of acquiring information. Gideon, unlike other tarnished, does not travel outside of the round table hold. He has people who do that for him. It is well documented that Gideon has an extensive network of spies across the lands between reporting to him. Ensha, his right-hand man, carries out his operations and leads his forces wherever Gideon dispatches them. Henricus is an example of one of Gideon's men on the inside. He can invade our tarnished as a recusant, but he wears the eye surcoat. The insignia emblazoned on the front marks out the wearer as the eyes and ears of Sir Gideon, the All-Knowing. His armor shows us that Henricus' true allegiance is to Gideon, and that his time as a recusant is likely a ruse to gather as much information as he can on Reichard. With his network of Tarnished, Omen Slayers, and other forces, Gideon learns all he can without ever leaving the safety of the Round Table. Upon reaching the Tarnished's haven ourselves, Gideon is dismissive of us. He grows tired of seeing Tarnished make their way to the Lands Between only to fail time and again. He says he's sick and tired of them. These Namby Pamby Tarnished think us no more than a shelter from the rain. It seems as though he does not believe any who have come through the round table as of late are worthy of his time or attention. They have no use to him, so he has no use for them. 
The exception to this would be his adoptive daughter, Nefeli Lu. Nefeli tells us how Gideon took her under his wing. She believes he can bring about a new world as Elden Lord, where the suffering she experienced as a child will never affect those under his reign. It is through her story we can see the callousness of Gideon Ofnir, as after she learns of his attack on the Albanaric village, he casts her aside. A woman he called Daughter was nothing more than a disposable tool. Gideon had a use for her strength, and maybe even took an interest in her due to her surname, Lou, but ultimately, he can't control her through deception, so he has no need for her. We ourselves are made a puppet of Gideon's if we choose to work with him after having our conference with the Two Fingers, and become true members of the Round Table Hold. He asks that we exchange information in a mutually beneficial way. He will point us to the shard bearers, we will take their runes and report to him anything suspicious or new that we might learn. The information we can bring him proves his own ignorance to the areas of the lands between where he has no spy network and refuses to travel himself. But before we discuss that, let's take a look at Ensha. Ensha is Gideon's personal bodyguard, and while he doesn't speak to us, he has a larger role to play in our relationship to his master. After leading the attack on the Albanarg village that Gideon instructed, Ensha left behind a man we can meet with in order to obtain half of the Halic Tree Medallion. It was Ensha's job to procure this medallion, but in his failure, he saw opportunity. His fervor to complete his mission had him attack us after returning to the hold, and after we defeat him, Gideon comes across as completely unbothered. He tells us Ensha got ahead of himself, implying that the attack was always coming. Ensha simply acted too soon, before he gives us a half-hearted apology. From here, Gideon asks us to find the Albanoric woman, who has the other half of the medallion. It seems as though in his eyes, Ensha is no great loss if an even stronger warrior can bring him the answers he's looking for. As we progress this quest and others through the lands between, we learn of the demigods Gideon didn't know the locations of, Mikola, Melania, and Moog. Once we find the consecrated snowfield, we can relay this information to Gideon, who wonders about the fate of Mikola, who it seems he assumes is dead. We then face Melania, and upon hearing Mikola was removed from the Hallow Tree, he says, How vexing that the all-knowing didn't have the full story. It bothers him to have been wrong about Mikola's fate. Upon defeating Moog, we can relay to Gideon Mikola's location. He'll thank us for the intel and tells us that as long as Mikola sleeps, all will be well, as Mikola is the one demigod who is truly a mystery to him. After giving him each piece of intel, Gideon provides us with a spell known only to him, showing us that while he doesn't leave the hold, he truly does possess ancient knowledge that he hoards for himself, only willing to exchange it to further his goals instead of providing it to all of the Tarnished of the Round Table as their leader. Gideon does not gain knowledge in order to help put any Tarnished on the throne, only himself. Upon burning the Erd Tree, Gideon is unfazed, simply saying that if it is necessary to become Elden Lord, then let the tree burn. He will memorize the knowledge of his library and be on his way, allowing the Round Table to burn behind him. We then meet Gideon again in the same place we once fought a spectral vision of Godfrey himself. He stands there, greeting us, and says, I knew you'd come to stand before the Elden Ring, to become Elden Lord. What a sad state of affairs. I commend your spirit, but alas, none shall take the throne. Queen Marika has high hopes for us, that we continue to struggle. Unto eternity. This seems like a confusing turn for the All-Knowing, as he told us before that his own desire was to become Elden Lord, but his armor sheds some light on this. Knowledge begins with a recognition of one's ignorance, the realization that the search for knowledge is unending. But when Gideon glimpsed into the will of Queen Marika, he shuddered in fear at the end that should not be. Gideon, in his search for knowledge, believes he understands the truth of Queen Marika's intent, 
that we struggle forever, fighting uphill to take the throne, only to be cast aside again and again so that the current state of the lands between is never disturbed. This is an assumption on Gideon's part, and there is evidence we can find with the help of Melina that helps us to interpret Merica's will to be something else entirely. Check out our video on the history of the Tarnished for more information on that. But Gideon, with his pompous attitude, cannot accept that anyone can have a greater understanding of the truth behind the throne than the all-knowing himself. Upon his defeat, he even says, I in my bones a tarnished cannot become a lord. Not even you, a man, cannot kill a god. This obviously is proven false, as we immediately go on to kill a god. Sir Gideon Ofnir was a man unwilling to get his hands dirty until he absolutely had to. He grew his influence by becoming the leader of the Round Table Hold, a title we don't know how he attained, and may even have been self-appointed. He developed a network of other people to do his dirty work for him. As a ruler, he'd have likely been a monster if his actions throughout Elden Ring are anything to go on. His lust for the throne bolstered his lust for knowledge, and his fervor for being all-knowing led to him making assumptions without verification. After deciding he understood the truth behind Queen Merica's intentions, he forgot the words he once espoused, that knowledge begins with the recognition of your own ignorance, and that the search for knowledge is unending. Gideon decided he knew best, that he was the authority, and in doing so, he challenged us, believing his truth stood above all else, and in the end, he was struck down so that we could ascend. Thank you for joining us for this dissection of Sir Gideon Ofnir, the All-Knowing. We hope you enjoyed this look at his background, story, and our thoughts on the motivations behind his actions. Did you find any details about Gideon's influence in the Lands Between? Should we have discussed the eye motifs found throughout the Lands? While we think many are unrelated to Gideon, are there any that you think are? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on our Elden Ring content. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore.